Hi, it's uh, Leon Ferranti from uh, Art in Adelaide, coming to you from the mill in uh, Adelaide in Angus Street. And today I'm going to be talking to Hamish Fleming, an artist uh, at the mill. Hi Hamish, how are you going? Hey, how are you doing? No, not too bad. Good. Um, I was going to ask you about some of your work mm. and uh, how you select, how you choose to paint the objects that you paint on, on your canvas. So yeah, the specific subject matter in the still life, especially in, I'm assuming you're talking about those really composite ones where they're a lot of different objects rather than sort of one focal. Yeah, yeah. It, it intrigues me because in some of those you've got the little Italian coffee machine and yeah. a few other little objects and they, for me, they kind of tell a, a sub story of their own. An important piece of, of knowledge, I guess, is that all the objects will be mine. So I own them, all of them, and I probably use most of them on a daily basis. So you'll see a lot of the coffee pots, um, either the mocha pot, the stovetop one, or um, the little, I think people call it a French press, I've always called it a plunger. Reasoning behind the still life is as to what goes in and why it goes in and how it's presented. Uh, for example, some stuff is incredibly metaphorical. And the easiest way to pinpoint that is how clear is the correlation between all the objects. So if something's really obvious, I mean, if you've got, you know, coffee pot, coffee cup, probably not a whole lot of metaphorical symbolism to delve into there, it's pretty straightforward. When you've got those pieces that have a more eclectic array, yeah. and any object presented to a viewer, the viewer has an idea associated with what that means. What does it remind them of? Right down to, you know, their experience of that object, how they've interacted with it, all the way to like smell, taste, sound even. And so partnering them up differently and layering them or clustering them together plays off those connotations alongside each other. A very striking artwork mm. uh, and it it has a lot of little objects placed strategically. Yeah, so this one's quite, again, this is another similar to the phone. This is like a really aesthetically based painting. Um, it touches on a lot of gothic things, like gothic okay. literature. So you've got green because of the connotations of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, Dead Rose, the entire poetical works of Lord Alfred Tennyson, <laughs> um, my boots, little stack of stuff down the bottom. Um, the zipper fluid's actually mostly included as a touch of red to bring out more of the green. Okay. Same as yeah. the red shades in the wood. And it sort of, yeah, it goes into the chromatic richness of the green velvet as one of the primary things. So do you get feedback from viewers that go as deep as that? Because when I looked at some mm. of the stuff, I. I didn't go that deep, but I but I kind of understood what you were doing, that it was a, a personal distribution and they meant something to you and some of them were sitting underneath the, the, the chair or mm. somewhere that you wouldn't expect to find them. It's up to the viewer. You know, you'll, looking at my work is very much a, you get what you give. Um, if you want to pay a lot of attention to it, there's a lot to find. If you want to read into it, right down to the finest level of, you know, why is this brush stroke here? Mm. Then you're going to get the full um, sort of meaning, I guess, behind it. You're going to get the full value out of it if you want to go down to that level. If you want to look at it at more of a base level, you're going to get a base level back. Um, that's why often when people ask for, and, and not inside an artist statement, maybe uh, at an opening in person, they'll ask, oh, I want a full breakdown now. I want, I want to know all of it all the way down. My answer is no. Yeah. I'm not just going to give it to you. And do you think that's necessary for, for everybody, like to break it down and say, this piece is about all these things no. when you're communicating exactly no. what you try to display, you know? I don't think that's the value that everyone wants to find in what they're looking at. You know, if it's something you're interested in, then you're more inclined to look that deep. I think if you want, if you're looking for the full maximum value out of the work, then yeah, you got to go that deep. That's that's just it. You know, everything is in there and presented the way it is, very, very deliberately. 
even if it's an accident, even if it's looser and less controlled, it's a controlled accident. Everything has its purpose. Okay. Do you write a bit of a, a storyline before you paint? Do you do a like a for intents and purposes a flow chart? No. Or do you just it just comes straight out? No, I, I will have a thought or a notion or something will happen. My entire practice, my entire <laughs> being is based off basically events and responses. Something I saw on a street or something yeah. I've experienced or it can be just, again, me with me. And from that, what you're seeing is a filtration down of a response. So something will happen and I will create a response and then I will learn how to translate that response into a way that looks and feels the way I want it to, with room for the viewer as well. You know, I'm not here to just watch my own work. Yeah. I especially would find that incredibly boring. <laughs> and then yeah, objects will be selected on that and then they're delicate, they'll be composed. I mean, I don't use any reference photos so I have the things on the table. Um, and I will spend anywhere between five minutes and the longest I've taken is like an hour and a half tweaking things, adjusting lighting, elevating the heights, changing the composition up. Before I even draw it up, I need to have it set out in a way that looks the way I want it to. And if something looks very, very natural, I assure you it is not. Um, the most natural looking sort of, I guess, scenes depicted in my work will be incredibly, incredibly refined. Save a few pieces, which are natural and natural. Um, odds are they're very, very much deliberate. That lampshade has a beautiful design. Is mm -hmm. that a real shade or did you make it? Yeah, it's a real shade. Yeah. It's a shade that I've got. It's my bedside table. Um, this is the first sort of softer painting I made. It's quite tender. Um, everything else of mine is either quite dark or quite harsh or a combination of both because this is quite soft. It's interesting the background seems curved. Mm. Well I mean it's the way that the shadow casts out from the lampshade. You've got a rounded lampshade you're going to get a sort of parabolic yeah. curve. Oh but it's interesting that you've got no other descriptors in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I just wanted to keep it very atmospheric and centred on a few things. I mean, half the painting is background. Sometimes when you're doing things for art prizes mm. and art shows, that because you're working to a, a different theme or a different brief, that you change what you do. Yeah. And then at other times you try to fit I, in with, you, yeah. fit your work into that I, exhibition. I refuse to fit my work specifically to briefs. If the brief does not, if there's not something I'm already working on or something I've done or something I'm considering doing, basically if I wouldn't produce it without being handed that brief, um, unless it's a brief that I find really inspiring, mm. um, in which case, yep. But if I wouldn't produce it regardless of the brief, it's not being made. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to cave to just make something specifically to chuck in a prize. Like if the brief is right, then it's the right price for me to enter and I'm going to care about it more and it's just going to be better for everyone. How has your journey been into the art realm? I mean obviously you started at some point and you decided to, to become an artist and, and mm. have your practice and so forth. No I started being curious about theatre first because one of my older brothers was interested in theatre um, and I, I didn't like the performative culture so much. It just wasn't for me. And at the same time, I was studying STEM in high school. So science, technology, engineering, maths all mm -hmm. rolled into one, very much under the encouragement of my family members. I was kind of keen, but not really. And I decided to drop out of STEM and do an art subject line. That was, you know, I was able to just sort of shift my timetable. And within about a month, I knew that this was more fulfilling than anything I'd ever done outside of that. I, I'd done other creative things. I mean, I used to be a smithy, and then I was a leather worker, okay. and then I got into art. I mean, that was sort of 
a more practical experience that's probably led me into having the, I guess, some of the drive to do the painting. It's really mind and hands. Yeah, right? mind and hands. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, very, very physical. I mean, I can tell you now that uh, my wrist, uh, my shoulder is slightly thrown out and I'm tired, um, but that's because I've been producing work that I'm quite happy with. Um, so I was going to digress because yeah. uh, that, that brings me to uh, the choice of oil as a, mm, as a okay. medium. Okay, oil as a medium. Yeah. Um, and you can go back to the other stuff, but it yeah. just intrigues me that people can choose something like oils because it is, in a way, or can be more labour intensive. It allows me to accommodate for sort of mental gymnastics that go on. You can change things, you can actually, it happens in real time. It doesn't happen faster than I'm thinking about it, and it doesn't happen any slower. You know, things are dry, or a layer is dry and I can't really work on it when I'm done thinking about it. Because I haven't changed anything, because I haven't thought about it, anything I wanted to edit or add. I also just found that I liked it more. It, texture, the paint itself, I liked. I liked the chemistry side of it, um, which leads into the <laughs> science and medicine roots. My dad's a scientist, so there comes in the chemistry stuff and then the light theory. And so you had sort of a somewhat academic that applies nicely to people as well as materials and the sciences that are associated with realism. Because in realism, you're, le you're learning a lot of science, and then in oil, you're learning a lot of chemistry and whatnot. And the nursing side, um, from my mum, sort of encouraged the curiosity and the willingness to explore, but explore beyond the surface level of subject matter and go into the deeper, richer, emotional and psychological content. Yeah. Um, but then you've got, you know, my dad's in agricultural science. It's a very practical, it's farming science. It's a really, really working class science. Of the earth. Yeah, yeah, of the earth. And he comes from like, you know, fourth generation farmer. I think He's, with scientists that, that I've experienced, and I'm hmm. a science graduate as well, is that there is that creative side always yeah. present and it's always trying to break out. Same with uh, most scientifically or academically based things, especially something that's more practical like nursing or like you know, a science where you're innovating to solve things because creativity is fundamentally the most useful thing for solving problems. Yes, I, I understand your concept now because <clears throat> I think humans have a lot of problems with making mistakes. Yep. And so when we make mistakes, we tend to think, well, it's over now, I'm throwing it in the bin and I can't do anything with it, what you're bringing to it is, well, nothing's ever finished until you fix yeah. what you're fixing. It's not about fixing mistakes. It's, again, it's that thing of catalysts and responses. A mistake is a catalyst, mm. so respond to it. Yeah. You don't have to fix it. It's how you respond to it that yeah. matters. Yes. For example, in August, I was in a head-on car accident, and my first response was, cool, Let's make a painting. <laughs> Let's make a painting that works. Uh, but I was fascinated with the experience because it was, you know, quite bad, and it was something you probably, from a statistic level, shouldn't have lived through, but it did. So it's a very valuable experience. And that's a ridiculous example of a catalyst. That's a massive catalyst. Um, and my response was to make a very small painting. Again, catalysts, responses. We don't fix an entire mistake. A mistake is part of what's going, running you through the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, I probably said it the wrong way, but I guess even mm. when you look at the masters, they, they would often repaint over a, yeah. a canvas or a, a board of wood because materials were Materials are precious. You know? That's the thing with oil as well, is it layers really beautifully and painting over the top of a layer of oil looks nicer than mm. painting onto a fresh canvas. You've got an exhibition on at the mill at I do. the moment, combined with... Uh, Julianne, With Julianne. Brandt. Yep. Yeah. And um, is there anything you wanted to sort of explain or discuss about that? So the three I especially quite like or quite like discussing are the three in the frames on the wall. So you've got still life of the work boots. Oh yes. You've got the painting of the bus stop and still life of the oil lamp with the 
coffee pot again. Yeah, now I've seen some of those, yeah. probably all of them, and the bus stop one threw me. Good! That's what it's for. It's probably me, <clears throat> but I looked at it and I thought, hmm, a little Japanese thing. There's that um, <clears throat> geometry in it, and so that's one association that you would get. Uh, other people got connotations associated with Japanese setting based off extensive, people had watched extensively the Studio Ghibli films, oh, because okay. yeah. solitary bus stops appears to be something that um, the producers and the animators really like. It's a setting I like as well. Um, it's not influenced by that. That'd mm. be cool. It's not. Um, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't make that much of a niche reference. Uh, that bus stop is great. That is a great painting. Um, I do not say that very lightly about my own work. Usually, I can rip anything I've made to shreds on a critical level um, because I'm almost never satisfied. Which is, you know, fine, because then I apply it yeah. to the next thing. It's great. Um, you know, sometimes a pain, but that's all right. When I happened on it the other day, when I came to the um, exhibition, I looked at it, and the first thing that hit me was Japan. Mm. I got this Japanese feel from it. And I guess that's the structure of the, yeah, structure. the bus stop. But um, I didn't even think it was a bus stop initially. Mm. But it's, it's got a, a real sombre, softly spoken attitude. It's very soft. It's lonely. It's lonely, but it's not, well, it's not lonely, it's solitary. Yes. You know what I mean? It's yes. not like, oh, I'm alone. It yeah. sucks. Um, it's just, you are alone. You are looking at it by yourself. There is no one in it. Um, it's, I like it because it, I'm happy with it, one, because I like the way it looks. <laughs> The bus stop is fantastic. I wouldn't change anything. It was enjoyable to make. It is enjoyable to look at. It's an A4 sized painting. It asks very little of the viewer other than to look at it. Um, I'm happy with the level of realism that it depicts. I'm happy with the way that the brush strokes are lined out. I'm happy with it on a chemical level. Um, it was a setting that really deeply appealed to me. And as much as I can use symbolism and everything to try and convey a feeling or a mood or any kind of content and I can break it down into hundreds of tiny little objects. The peak will always be to present something as close as possible to how I saw it, Include, which means on a subconscious level emphasizing the features that stood out to me more. You get closer to my literal perception my literal visual perception, which brings in a lot of the emotional content. And that bus stop is great because it is a nothing setting. It is not interesting. It's not, there's nothing fundamentally interesting. I mean, yeah, I've painted it, so obviously it has interest to it. There's nothing fundamentally interesting about it. But there's so it. much of interest in it. But there's so there. much of <clears throat> interest in it, yeah. Um, the, the background's very deep yep. and dense. And, uh, I did it. And I've only looked at it a couple of times, but not in depth. Trust me, uh, And I was to taking a lot of photos more. and stuff, so I was all over the place. But it's mm. good to hear you talk about the size because yep. often when we see photographs um, of paintings, we don't yep. know their actual size. And so when you think about, say, something like the Mona Lisa's only a small artwork, um, you basically presented something in A4 format. Yeah. And I thought, no, it's good because you don't spend time looking at all the other bits. You can't of, get, you can't you focus get, you straight can't in on get the distracted. artwork. Yeah. You can't get distracted and it doesn't <clears throat> bombard you with anything. You know, you're not, I'm not shouting at you with it. Yeah, yeah. It's there if you want it, if you don't. Walk on by. Walk on by. That's the nice way of phrasing <laughs> that. <laughs> I must ask you the obvious question. Yep. Um, and I do that in a lot of my interviews because I think people do get frustrated with it and, and mm -hmm. see this as a, maybe as a problem, maybe it's not. Yep. But when you're doing your work and you, mm -hmm. and you play with your work a lot yep. before you're finished, how do you know when you've reached that critical point where you've actually finished? Where more time you're ready to sign. Where more time spent would be more time wasted. Now that's a little formula, but yep. you, you can't explain in depth today. But nope. Um, there's a point where, at least in this attempt, you're not going to get any better. 
So more time spent is more time wasted. So you're not and you're drawing your and you're losing from when you start from the catalyst to when you start. You're pretty much good. You're not going to lose that amount of time, but you're going to lose the original sentiment as you keep working. You start more with that emotional thing in mind, or that even if it's just wow, I thought this was really stunning because that's the th that's the bus stop. I was there. I painted it from life. I was sitting there and I was like, wow, that's actually just for reasons I cannot explain or I do not care to spend the time explaining to another person. That's stunning. It's incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Yes. And this is an experience that I think is worth giving that sort of recognition to. Perfect. It does speak for itself. Mm. I think that's probably it. Yeah, we good? <laughs>